morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on when you're tuning in. I'm your host, Captain Rob Bodies. Welcome to Catch You Outdoors, presented by the Waypoint Podcast Network at waypointtv.com. Mark your calendars. Saturday, October 29th, I'll be at the Books Inside and Out Mini Book Fair in Oakland Park, Florida. Authors, editors, and others involved in publishing will share their stories, publish books at the FLM Gordon Oakland Park Library. That's at 1298 Northeast 37th Street in Oakland Park, Florida. Book lovers, readers alike will want to come and join us in this first-of-a-kind community event. No fee for admission and books of all genres will be for sale just in time for holiday gift giving. Hope to see you there. I'll have signed copies of Bridge to Paradise and what I know about fish in Southwest Florida, along with information about my soon to be released Take a Kid Fishing, an adult's guide for introducing youngsters to the world of angling. This is episode 56 on the water, mostly. <laughs> Going to do most things on the salt water for the next half hour or so. But first, a very brief Hurricane Ian afterstorm update. Sanibel Bridge is made whole again, and teams of power and restoration are on the island. Word has it that the bridge will open to residents about the 21st of October. Fort Myers Beach, uh, Mantanzas Pass Bridge is open on the north end. That's the one on the north end of the island, the big bridge. Um, bridges to the south end are still closed. Seem there's a problem with approaches, and the big Carlos Bridge has a, has a, a, a slipped a little <laughs> quoting that slipped i'm not sure what slipped means but they can't be good uh beach is a wreck uh no other way to put it but floridians are tough and i'm sure over time things will be rebuilt as insurance and other monies allow it ain't gonna be like it used to be folks it's gonna be quite some time uh matt lachey got their power back on friday night pine island is still in the works still a mess uh, a lot of a lot of power poles down. Uh, Stringfellow is a long road that runs all the way up and down Pine Island. That's I think that's 17 miles of power lines, and they are working on it. But it's just going to take a little extra time. Um, let's see. Heard that Cabbage Key survived, as did Tarpon Lodge. They're serving some food at Cabbage Key. They're giving it, most of it away for free to so the workers that are out there doing doing work in Pine Island Sound and on those those remote islands that have no bridges. Uh, that's noble. I think it's great. And the Tarpon Lodge is doing well, too. They posted a picture. If you've been to the famous Tarpon Lodge, uh, there's a wonderful little bar in there, and it has a tarpon over the mantelpiece, and the tarpon is still there. And, and everybody was like, you, you could hear the cheers. Uh, cleanup and some rebuilding will take place at those locations. If you're planning on visiting Southwest Florida, especially areas along beaches, it'd be a really good idea to check uh, with your favorite resort hotel, motel, to see if they are open or not. Houses, you know, if you've, you've you know, bed and breakfast type stuff. Um, or in some cases, even still there. I hate to say that, but there are some stuff that just disappeared in this storm. Um, so you need to know that. I'd personally like to give out thanks and kudos to the many out-of-state linemen um, and others, uh, bucket operators, Good grief. Bulldozers, anything you can think of. You guys have helped so much. And I know you've come from far away. Um, I recently saw a photo of, of Alabama Power and, uh, and uh, North Carolina Power. There's a lot of power companies here helping out. So I really, really appreciate that. I also want to thank our governor and the local mayors of all these different towns. Quick responses have really paid off. Um, all the areas affected have got some sort of work going on. So let's just kind of keep it going. Uh, special thanks to Captains for Clean Water. Great organization. I'm happy to be a member. They've gone out of their way to supply necessities to those that need them most. Man, I'm seriously, hats off. Um, one of their big sponsors is Yeti. Those of you that boat and guide and carry on, you know of the Yeti product. Um, Yeti donated 100 coolers. And these are the, the bigger ones, not the little baby coolers, real, real coolers. 100 of them to Captains for Clean Water to fill up and take to people in need. I just, that's unbelievable. You know, it's, I'm a Yeti fan. I think my Yeti has got to be 10 to 12 years old. I bought one at the first iCast show. Um, it was a guy deal. It was like, I was like, $300, man, that's a lot for a cooler. And the guy goes half price for captains. I'm like, all right. But then I, then I started, I stopped and did the math. Okay. I was going through, I won't name the brand, but you all know the coolers that we all were using. I was going through tons of, literally three or four a year. That's how bad on guide boats it can be. The hinges rust, the latches rust, the, the top starts to break. Uh, they don't keep ice all day. Um, anyway, 
And so, and you pay 22 to $35 for a decent cooler, you know? So I'm sitting there doing the math on this. Uh, that cooler is still in my garage. We use it, even though I'm not guiding anymore. It was on three different boats while I guided. I, um, I blowed it in the back of the Jeep. We put stuff in it. We throw ice in it and we take it on our tra- overnight travels and it will keep ice until we get home like two days later. It's just, and it's still like it was when I got it. It's it's rough for wear. It's got marks all over it, but the cooler itself is, I can't say enough nice things about the Yeti product. It's, it's excellent. So anyway, uh, uh, last but not least, uh, to the local professional captains that were able to get their boats back on the water and run supplies and folks out to the islands uh, way before the bridges got repaired, and they're still doing it, actually. You guys are the best. I, I'm, I'm a hats off to you. It's really just, uh, I'm, I'm very, very happy that you guys are able to do that. I know things are going to get very, very tough here soon. Once the islands are put back together, booking trips will probably not happen right away, uh, unless it's locals, unless it's locals that know things are are better okay for the fishing side. I got to tell you what, fishing has been great out there. I have seen several offshore reports in the Gulf of Mexico. I have seen some backcountry reports because hardly anybody's fishing, of course. So these are guys that I happen to know or I share a Facebook page with. Um, But they're making some outstanding catches, which is usually what, as I remember from Charlie and Irma, two that I went through, I I remember that, especially Charlie. I mean, I was I was heavy into guiding when that happened. And after it was over, there was an awful lot of fish running around, things to catch, lots of bait, you know, and they're not being bothered. I mean, I I hate to say it, but ain't nobody out there right now except for guys running people back and forth and, and supplies. So, yeah, let's just hope that all that works. So now for uh, the a little on the water segment, there are dozens of posts from uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife this past week. So I'm I'm going to start there, and I, I guess what it'll do is I'll just go through those right now. Um, first thing I want you to do, if you're not already, if you're a Floridian and and you're getting your rule books and all that stuff, or you're looking up like, okay, what what seasons what and when does it close? I got on the other day and discovered they'd made some pretty serious changes. I don't know when this happened. I confess. Because I'm fishing <laughs> part time, you know. I mean, I'm just fishing when I want to go, and I know the regs pretty well, and I pay attention to like my closures. I kind of know when they are, but I didn't realize they'd changed the website, and it's fantastic. Uh, go to myfwc.com and check out the recreational regulations page. Just do the search that way, find that page. They have listed all the recreational fish that we kind of go after. You click on the fish, it pops up, and then it gives you a complete breakdown on all the rules statewide. Shows the zones, shows what's open, what's closed, shows length, uh, bag limits. It's all in there, and it's so much easier to read than it used to be. Um, pretty impressed with that. So check it out. That's it. Go to uh, go to myfwc, myfwc.com. Uh, let's see. FWC announces opening a fall recreational red snapper season in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this is a big deal for people that are out in the Gulf. It used to be red snapper was almost impossible to uh, fish for, uh, much less keep. Uh, but that has changed as the numbers have improved and also the reporting of numbers has improved. Uh, so here's your seasons. Uh, eighth and ninth have already gone by. So let's do, let's see, what is today? Today is the, I said that one's gone. Okay, next weekend. Uh, it was open 8, 9, 15, 16. That got lost in all the hurricane stuff on the on the hardcore west coast of Gulf. October 22 through 23 is the next one. That's following weekend. Then the 11th through the 13th, it's open again. And then 25 through 27. So these are basically red snapper weekends. Um, during the season, private recreational anglers may harvest red snapper in the Gulf and state federal waters. So that's both. However, state for hire operators are limited to fishing for red snapper in Gulf state waters only. So if you're a hire boat, if you are a charter boat, you cannot go out in the federal waters and take customers out there. Kind of a bummer, but that's the way it works. FWC will continue to monitor, uh, monitor harvest relative to Florida's available quota. So not bad. All right, let's see here. I'm moving right along. Redfish is open currently. The length is 18 to 27, one per person. It's open all up and down the west coast of Florida. It was closed for a very long time in southwest Florida in the, let's just call it the Lee County, Charlotte Harbor region. There's a little more to it than that, but all that's open now. So, And it's pretty much back to the old rules. So you have 18 to 27 inch slot, one per person per day, two per vessel. That's pretty important. That is a change. You, you can't take four guys out there and each one of you take one red anymore. If there's four of you on the boat, 
you get two. That's it. So um, let's see. Flounder closed on the 15th of this month, just a few days back. It's funny. We never thought much about flounder. Of course, people in the north and the east coast are wild about flounder. But down in the Gulf Coast areas where I was, it was rare to get one. But if you did, it was almost always big enough. Um, They raised the size limit, I believe. Okay, I'm not looking at it, but I think it's 14 now and it was 12. Uh, But anyway, it is closed. It'll open back up on November 30th. So it's it's about a month and a half closure. Snook remains closed on the west coast of Florida primarily. That would be the Charlotte Harbor. Well, it's actually a little further north than that, but all the way south to, uh, it's like the upper reaches of Collier County. So just so you know. So Snook remained closed. It was supposed to open when Redfish opened, but they decided not to do that. Um, let's see. And that's closed until uh, December the 1st would be the normal. So it's, it's normally... Uh, Is that right? Yes, yes. So they have to decide what they're going to do after December 1. They don't know. Normally, there'd be another opening December 1 until the end of February, but that is still up in the air, so stand by for that. And again, that is only in that region. Um, Let's see. What else have I got here? Um, FWC reminds boaters. Oh, yeah, this is important. This should have gone with the hurricane stuff. Use caution after Hurricane Ian. Uh, aftermath of Hurricane Ian, focus Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation, blah, 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 blah. Basically, the water is a mess from the northern 10,000 islands all the way up to into Punta Gorda, into Charlotte Harbor, and a little north of that. The wind blew, the waters came. I learned today that they had 15-foot surge off of Fort Myers Beach, 15 feet. Um, so everything that was in the water, or on, on land, I'm sorry, is in the water, <laughs> a lot of it, especially in the back bay. Um, Astero Bay, there's actually a house sitting uh, slightly inside of New Pass. Uh, last time I heard it was New Pass to the south of New Pass. So anyway, be aware of that. <laughs> well, that one you can see. The problem is, like when Charlie happened, when all, all these other hurricanes, there's all these trees and dock pieces and stuff like that that are waterside. Now it's really big stuff. It's cars. It's boats. It's sunken huge hunks of stuff, barrels, things that you don't know are there. If you hit that with your boat, you could bust off the outdrive or worse yet, kill yourself. You just you have to be careful. So please go slow if you're traversing these places. The captains that I've talked to who are working out there right now trying to get people in and out and supplies in and out said it's it's really it's crazy especially the channel areas the channels have all changed it pushed all the sand around so anywhere that you used to see like a, one of those floating markers, like a nun buoy, something like that, There is there, that may not be right anymore, probably not right anymore. And most of the markers in Pine Island Sound are gone. There are no markers. So if you don't know your way around, um, well, it's dangerous because there's oyster bars, but it's also going to be kind of stupid if you run aground and just sit there until the next tide. Or it may be at a point where you hit it at high tide and you ain't getting off there until somebody comes and gets you. So, But the FWC is putting out the same report, same people. Be very, very careful. They would just prefer that you not be on the water after sunset. Uh, there are some areas where they've set up curfews. Um, uh, so you need to double check your boating area. But there are some uh, uh, some areas that they're not allowing boats to uh, traverse um, in the evenings and at night. Back to the fish. Um, applications for limited recreational harvest of Goliath grouper in state waters opens the 15th. Now, remember, that is not out in the federal waters. That is in state waters. However, you can find Goliath grouper in back bays if you know where to look. Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission will soon accept applications for the first harvest of Goliath grouper in state waters since 1990. Those interested can apply anytime from October 15th through the 30th. For the upcoming 2023 season, which will be highly regulated, limited harvest. Um, Let's see. You can apply for a $10 fee at GoOutdoorsFlorida.com. Details. here, Here we go. We'll give you a quick rundown on this craziness. Total recreational harvest of up to 200 Goliath per year with a maximum 50 from Everglades National Park. A Goliath harvest permit and tag issued via a random draw lottery, 150 residents, $500 for for non-residents, I'm sorry, 150 for residents, 500 for non-residents plus fees are required to participate. Permits and tags are non-transferable and no exemptions apply. A limited of one fish per person per open season with permit and tag. An open season from March 1 through May 31st, 
It's pretty much springtime. Hook and line is the only allowable gear. Slot limit 24 to 36 inches total length. Post harvest requirements, including proper application of the tag, report the data, and submitting a fin clip for genetic analysis. Um, harvest will be permitted in all state waters except those of Martin County, south through the Atlantic coast of the Keys, all of the St. Lucie River and tributaries, and Dry Tortugas National Park. You can't catch them there. Harvest will continue to be prohibited in all federal waters. Um, the, this is a lottery, just so you know, and it's going to be expensive as all get out. Um, you're going to plop your money down. They're going to do a drawing, and you may or may not get one. <laughs> Just so you know. And I really don't know how many they're going to. They didn't put in this how many they're going to draw. All it says is it's 150 bucks for locals and 500 for out of towners. That's pretty much and other fees. Uh, so, anyway, there you go. I personally, you know, people ask me, what do you think about that? I, I, I think it's crazy, but that's just me. You know, you, there's two sides of the Goliath grouper story. There's the guys who tell you they steal everything off the reef, which is not true. And I think I base my decisions on science. If fish and wildlife and the scientists with fish and wildlife thinks it's okay to do a lottery system for a limited number of fish, okay. Um, the reality is Goliath grouper do not go around eating snapper and other grouper. They eat uh, lobster. And crabs. That's, I mean, lobster is one of their main foods. Um, they're crustacean eaters. That's what they like. When you wound a fish by hooking it and you start to bring it up, they eat what's easy. That's why it seems like that they're plowing into all the snapper. They are. They'll eat anything that you can. If you catch a, man, I had a grouper one time. I, I got it loose from a goliath. It measured 27 inches and a goliath tried to eat it. That happens because they go after the wounded as well. Uh, so please, please get your science right and understand they don't eat everything on the whole daggone reef. But if Fish and Wildlife thinks it's appropriate, okay, I'm certainly not going to spend $150 for a chance to go after one. That's just no. <laughs> no, nope, not going to do it. And if I were an outer towner, I certainly wouldn't spend $500. Uh, so anyway, that's the name of that tune. Oh, uh, the Florida, let's see, not the Florida, Fort Lauderdale International Boat Show is coming October 26th through 30th. It's known as FLIBS, F-L-I-B-S, FLIBS. It's also, you can get information at FLIBS.com. That's F-L-I-B-S.com. 13 days away at the time that I printed this. It's going to be a whole lot closer. Well, I don't know. You're going to listen to this tomorrow, so it won't be that far off. Um, I've been, I'm not going this year. I thought about it. I was going to go. And then I thought, you know, I'm just, I'm going to stay put in the keys and do a little fish and do a little hanging out. Um, the show is a blast. If you get a chance to go over and see it, you should. It is enormous. It, it actually pretty much, uh, it, it, it covers an enormous amount of space. Uh, a lot of it right off of Fort Lauderdale and at the at the marinas in Fort Lauderdale. And then, of course, it goes out to the convention center. Uh, they've got transportation uh, provided by the um, uh, water taxi systems. Uh, they got bus. they got service that runs back and forth. It's incredible. And you will see some of the most amazing yachts because it is the largest yacht show in the world. It's, it's gigantic. So if you get a chance to go, go. I'm just throwing those dates out there for you. I'm very disappointed in the local weather people. I've been wanting to fish. And Janelle and I were going to have a weekend of traveling the Keys and fishing, but alas, the forecast was completely off. Okay, boys, girls, mostly boys that I watch. I mean, come on now. We were supposed to have beautiful weather this weekend. It was supposed to be drier because the front was supposed to move through. And we that live in Florida know that this doesn't always happen this early. I mean, I realize it's October, and a lot of you folks that listen to this have already... Heck, I saw snowfall up in, up in uh, uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and up in that area. Now we don't get that. But what we do get is a little break from the heat and the humidity. Maybe not so much the heat. It'll still be 84, 85 degrees, but it'll be a lot drier. Well, it didn't happen. And what did it do all weekend? It rained. <laughs> and I mean, it really, really rained. It rained all over Florida. The last thing we need in Florida right now is rain, but it rained and rained and rained. However, we did get a local bicycle ride in. We left the house uh, Sunday and we pedaled. Was it Sunday or Saturday? I thought it was Sunday. We pedaled around the neighborhood and south of us and eventually wound up at Penny Camp State Park. Um, and by the way, there is a fee. We didn't know this. Um, we have state park passes, which pretty much let you into all the Florida state passes. You, it's an annual thing you buy. It's not very expensive. It's around $70 per person, but you can go to every single state park as much as you want. Um, 
There are extra fees for boats. If you're going to bring a boat, you're going to trailer a boat into a state park to launch at one of their ramps. Most of them charge ten dollars, but for just going, it's it's I love it. It's great. Um, the fee for the bikes is two fifty each. So if you ride a bicycle, and it does cost two dollars and fifty, our state park passes took care of that. But I just want to let people know that because I kind of I don't know I, for some reason I know pedestrians they don't charge for pedestrians at least they used not to, um, but I didn't know they charged for bikes. So just so you know, we had a really nice day. It was nice. It was laid back. I mean, we cruised around the local neighborhoods that are near us that we haven't been through. Well, I, I take that back. Janelle's done quite a bit of walking. I haven't been through it. Um, but we got on the bikes and rode around and looked at the houses and the waters and just stuff like that. So anyway, so fishing, I, I'm going to go tomorrow if the rain gods will let me. Tomorrow will be Tuesday when you're listening to this. So hopefully I'll have some fishing reports for you. I had planned on putting a fishing report into this podcast, but I don't make it up. <laughs> I could. <laughs> I know what's out there. Um, the last time I fished, I, I told you on the podcast last time, I had a hard time. Um uh, tides weren't quite right. It was post storm. Waters were much cooler. Waters were churned up a little bit. Um, so I think that has something to do with it, but I've got a, I got a new plan for this time. Um, I'm going to go tomorrow. I'm going to, um, slightly delayed. Like I said, I'm going to try probably fishing Tuesday and Wednesday, but I picked up some new castable artificial soft baits from DOA and, uh, they're part of the Cal series. Um, these are, uh, hang on a second. I'm going to sit right here on my desk. These are the, it's a new series of shad. Um, what makes them different is they are like your, your soft plastic, uh, sluggo style bait. But instead of having a, uh, the tail end either being single or a split tail, these have a paddle on them. Um, they had these before. Don't get me wrong. This is not something brand new. This is, but the color that I picked is new. Um, they, uh, they're really great. And I have a friend of mine, uh, a captain up North and he, you know, Ray Markham, Captain Ray Markham, he fishes out of Tampa or up in the Tampa Bay area. He, he, I mean, I think all he uses is artificial cows, even on charters. That's something that, that he's known for. And I thought I need to get on the bandwagon with this because in a kayak, bait's a pain in the butt, you know, just getting shrimp or doing that. I will do it eventually. I know I will, but it's much, much easier to throw artificials. So anyway, um, I also got some gulp shrimp. I got some of the three-inch gulp shrimp, the uh, new penny color, which has always been my favorite. And I picked up some DOA um, shrimp lures. Um, and these are a little different. These are called, um, uh, these are enhanced. They got bait fish oils in them. Uh, this time I also did something I haven't done in a while. Well, other than the new penny, I picked the colors in the cow and in the DOA uh, in a darker reddish, bloody red color. Um, I've had really good luck with whites, um, pearl white and glow, things like that. But I've, I've run, I mean, the, the barracuda are awful. Um, I like catching them. Don't get me wrong. When things are slow, you can always get a cuda. And they run pretty good size. You know, typically a real small one will be 15, 16 inches. But most of them back here in these bays are two feet long. And they put up a hell of a fight. But I'm looking for redfish, and I'm looking for more snapper. I've caught some beautiful snapper in the back, 16-inch snapper back there in the back country. Um, mangrove huggers, you know, you're in there looking for redfish, and you wind up with a, with a, a mangrove snapper. I'm not going to – I'm not going <laughs> to – good. <laughs> I, don't, I generally don't keep reds. I usually let them go. Um, but on mangrove snapper, nah, no, he's coming home for dinner. Uh, but anyway, so I'm going with these these uh, rusty red colors. I decided to completely switch gears and get off the white for a little bit. And let's see what happens. And I'll I'll try to give you a little report next week. Um, these are castables. Uh, I'll probably run them on a jig head or offset hooks. Uh, the offset will be weighted hooks. I like to do that uh, with a little uh, corkscrew things that you screw into the end of them. I they, you get a lot better action on those than you do on a jig head. So I'll kind of play with both. Um, don't have to worry about that on the DOAs. The DOAs come with a hook in them. Yes, you hook it through the nose. I know I've taught this in class. You probably shouldn't do that. That's not the direction that shrimp like to go in. They like to go backwards when they're startled. So at some point, I usually, f I'll fish the DOA under a cork. I'll mess around with it some. If I'm not having any luck, I'll cut the tail off. I'll pull the hook out and I'll rig it backwards, <laughs> plain and simple. Or sometimes I'll take the hook and the weight out of the DOA shrimp and um, rig a jig head, a uh, lead head jig, a little yellow jig or a red jig backwards through the tail. So 
Uh, but I'm going to give these a, a little bit of time and, and play with them because uh, I love to experiment and it's time to experiment. I got to tell you, I broke down and finally did it. I've been talking about doing this for quite a while, but I broke down and did it with the kayak. I ordered a Bixby motor. It's uh, B-I-X-P-Y. You can look it up at B-I-X-P-Y dot com, Bixby. Um, they have the coolest. I saw this at ICAST when I went to ICAST. I'd actually seen it in magazines before and people talked about it, but it was a lot better to touchy feely. You know, I'm, I'm one of these people that doesn't buy off of a catalog or the web unless, unless I've played with it and looked at it. Uh, but this little Bixby motor is pretty cool. Imagine the trolling motor, motor, the bottom of the trolling motor, smaller, lightweight, and shrouded in a heavy duty, it's like a carbon fiber type plastic, so it's not metal. And then it has a little tunnel around the prop, so it, it pushes more water through it. That drops in, in my case, it drops into the Hobie with an adapter. You actually screw that onto an adapter that's very similar to the drop in device that controls the pedals that you would normally have in there. And so now it's sticking out the bottom. And then you uh, hook that up to a battery that can go under your seat or behind your seat. And off you go for medium speed around four hours. I mean, it really lasts a long time. My purpose is not going to be to use it all the time. My idea when I first saw this was I need the exercise. I like pedaling the kayak. It doesn't bother me. Um, I can throw it into reverse. No trouble. You know, I just, I'm used to it. Um, this is this is like a backup for me. I get tired. My back starts bothering me. I'm old. You know, I've got this thing. I'm going to keep it on the kayak because it's small and compact. It's not very big. And when I am ready to go home, I'm going to pop it in and go home that way. I can pull the, the pedals out and just go the fins out and just go the heck with this. Man, I'll just pop this in, kick back, have a sandwich, drink a Gatorade and let it take me home. Um, I think it's the coolest thing ever. They make mounts for a lot of different vessels. Okay, so all these different kayaks, every one of them has a different pedal system. Every one of them has a different stern. Uh, you can get adapters to attach it to the stern with a tiller so you can steer with it. You don't need to worry about that in the Hobie because you already have a rudder. Uh, some people do mount them on the rear end of the Hobie and keep the pedals in. I talked to a couple people that have done that. They said, kind of like to be able to switch between the two without having to pull one out and put one in. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll see how that goes. Uh, but so you need an adapter. So you, you pay for the, the motor device, the battery, the remote control, and then you add the adapter to it to, to hook it up inside of, the, of whatever kayak you have. And they do make it for the Mirage series, the Outbacks. Uh, pretty cool. Very cool. So I'm excited about that. Hopefully I'll get it in a day or two. I may not get to experiment it with before the next podcast, but if I do, I'll certainly tell you how it goes. Last but not least, I failed to mention the Marker Resort last week. Uh, in the podcast. And, you know, I covered a lot about Key West. I love going to Key West. We'll obviously go back there again soon. Um, now it feels like it's right down the road because <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's a whopping hundred miles. You know, it's just it's, it's amazing to think how far we travel to get to Key West, just from Fort Lauderdale, for example. Uh, so now it's right down US 1. And US 1 is a fun, fun drive. I promise you, I'm going to do a couple of podcasts. I'm going to do one about bait shops, all up and down the keys. And I'm going to do another one with special places to stop, things to see, things to eat. I wrote an article years ago about driving down the Florida Keys US 1. And at the time, like what restaurants were fun to hit and where could you get a beer and 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 things to stop and see and stuff like that. And I thought, you know, I'm going to do that again for the podcast. I think that'll be kind of fun. So I'll get to that. Back to the marker. The marker resort is on the north end of the island. It's up by the old Turtle Crawls area. Uh, Schooner's Wharf, if you're familiar with that bar, that is clearly my second favorite bar. Hey, I'm telling you, Schooner, right now, you're my second favorite bar. The Green Parrot's my number one. Sorry, it just has to be Schooner's number two. But, man, it's a close one, too. Yeah, I mean, it could be 1-1, one, one, you know, as far as I'm concerned. The marker's right behind the Schooner Wharf, which for me is really dangerous, except for the fact I can walk home. Um it is a beautiful resort, much larger than Janelle and I thought it was. It has two main swimming pools, and it has a nice little private adult pool in the back. No children, no kids, no yelling, screaming, that kind of stuff. Um, great little restaurant on site. Great little poolside bar. Has live entertainment. Has music in the afternoons from about oh, from about noon till about 4 o'clock. Right before the sunset stuff starts, they stop the music. Um, but for us, it was really great access to all of Key West. Um, we could walk to Schooner's Wharf. We could walk to the Turtle Crawls area easily from where we were. It was 100 steps. Um, and then we had pretty easy access toward Mallory Square. And we, you know, we went all the way down to um, uh, Duval, 
went uh, the first night we were there, we went to the Green Green Parrot. We walked home from the Green Parrot, walked back to the hotel from the Green Parrot. So that northern area of Duval, all of Key West, uh, the major resorts up in that area are all accessible on foot. So nice to know. And they have a fabulous parking garage. It Parking is a pain in the butt in Key West. I'm not going to kid you. Um, most of the time, you're better off grabbing cabs and, and riding around than you are trying to drive. Um, but once you get into town, if you stay at the marker, you can stay in their private garage. And that in itself was worth the extra price of what the rooms cost. So keep it in mind, check it out. Very friendly people. It was really great. You know, size, rooms, big, proximity, service, all that stuff was really great at the at the Marker Resort in Key West. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate you taking the time to tune in. If you enjoyed the podcast, please tell a friend and leave a review. My podcasts are scheduled for each and every Tuesday. Catch you Outdoors is presented by the Waypoint Podcast Network and is available on Waypoint and by many of your favorite podcast providers. Facebook page is Catch you Outdoors. The website is waypointtv.com and catchoutdoors.com. Until next time, get outdoors and enjoy.